Greetings to all viewers. A very warm welcome to all of you. Kuzu Zangpola, Drukmisu. On this <laughs> forum, Zang. this evening, we are listening to a, a much useful, inspiring, and educative talk topic, and that is restorative learning. Uh, restorative learning is essentially, I believe, a holistic approach to good education. Such an initiative is designed to empower learners so that they comprehend from their own mistakes and develop their abilities to finding a solution to their hurdles and make responsible or matured decisions. Professor Thakur's Fodel's well-known book, My Green School, represents the eight vital elements. And these are mother nature, society, culture, intellect, academics, aesthetics, spirituality, and ethics. The word green is used as a metaphor, which means anything and everything that supports and sustains life and living. So friends, this evening, Asian Literary Society in association with Journal of Asian Art, Culture and Literature organizes an annual lecture. And we have on our forum, our esteemed guest, Professor Takuras Powder. Here I read his introduction. Professor Thakur Respodal is an educator by choice, conviction, and passion. His abiding interests are education as the noble sector, gross national happiness, institutional integrity, national self-respect, and ethical literacy. As Bhutan's Minister of Education, during 2008 to 2013, he with his colleagues moved Bhutan towards achieving the UN MDGs and constitutional mandate, particularly for education, making Bhutan the first country in the region to do so. Professor Podel's vision of holistic education expressed in his seminal My Green School has been translated into some 18 major languages around the world and counting. Professor Podel is a recipient of the Gusi Peace Prize International, Global Education Award, Samata Saitya Academy Award, and Institutional Award, the honor of Druk Tukse. He has been awarded the honorary doctorate in innovation education for his outstanding contribution to global education thought. Professor Podel is the author of As I Am, So Is My Nation, Right of Vision and Occasional Views, Gyal Khab, Reflections on State, Citizen and Citizenship Education, and is the principal author of The Light of My Life. He published with Nidrup Zangpo, Sherik Saga, Profiles of our Seeds of Learning, and Bhutan at her best, Sun Rays to the Rain, among other works. Professor Podol has represented his country at several high-level meetings, conferences, and summits, and is a member of important boards and foundations. As a member of parliament and public servant, Professor Podol invested his public office with a rare sense of dignity, integrity, and service born of his deep beliefs and convictions. Professor Podol remains deeply engaged in public service and reflects on the outer and inner life of his beloved country. Friends, please be with us, stay tuned. Sir, on behalf of Asian Literary Society, I warmly welcome you on the forum. Over to you, sir. Uh, 
thank you, um, Dr. Vishaka Sharma, and uh, all members of the Asian Literary Society, as well as uh, that of the Journal of Asian Art, Culture, and Literature, for this very kind invitation, as well as uh, a very generous introduction uh, that uh, actually already disarms me completely. At a point like this, uh, when um, the mode at which um, uh, on which the world operates is very prosaic, the Asian Literary Society softens that uh, prosaic mode with your deep uh, passion and uh, great work in terms of um, redeeming literature as well as sharpening the sensibilities of the readers. So to the Asian Literary Society in the journal, I would like to offer my tributes for the wonderful work that you're doing. And I know that in the last year or so, you have been celebrating the literary landscape, uh, the literary achievements, the literary impulse of this large continent and beyond. And um, you were so very gracious to include my own country, Bhutan, in the big celebration that ran for a full two days. And uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate the Asian Literary Society for being the recipient of um, a prestigious award from Facebook among so many contestants uh, that uh, vied for that uh, coveted award. This evening's um, brief um, conversation uh, that has, uh, I believe, brought together lovers of literature and practitioners of fine art from around the world. And um, I would like to hope that uh, this brief session is going to be worth your while. It's wonderful that uh, despite the challenges posed by the virus pandemic, uh, we're able to gather together like this, even though it is a virtual mode. I'm so grateful that we are all alive to be able to celebrate this uh, moment together, as well as to honor literature. The topic that has been circulated is My Green School, A Pathway to Restorative Learning. I think um, today we live in an unprecedented time. I agree with um, the great E.S. Eliot, uh, who, as far back as 1934, wrote in the wasteland, all our knowledge leads us nearer to ignorance. All our ignorance leads us nearer to death. Nearer to death, but no nearer to God. And somebody says, things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Today we live in a fragmented world. This Mother Earth faces unprecedented challenges imposed by human action or through hum human action. Our Mother Earth is bleeding. Our Mother Earth is crying. This COVID-19, global warming, climate change, natural disasters, fragmentation of our societies, our families, breakdown of cultures, all these are big writings on the wall. I think um, things have fragmented. Relationships have fragmented. Old certainties are no longer certainties. We do not have um, the benefit of those certainties. Our seasons, which came every every year at those um, very definite times. When it was time for spring to come, spring came. When it was time for summer to come, summer came. When it was autumn to come, our autumn came. And winter came as it ought to have come. Those seasonal patterns are no longer holding. Our relationships are becoming weaker and our abilities to connect, our abilities to harmonize, 
our ability is to see relationships underlying all phenomena have become so very weak. And educational systems around the world are facing their own share of challenges. Perhaps I'm the last soldier who still defends education as the noble sector. The wise ones in the past call education the noble sector. They had a good reason to call education the noble sector. It was an it was a, it was a medium through which great seeds of learning were able to help young men and women, boys and girls, the most precious segment of the population, cultivate the ability, cultivate the nobility of the mind, cultivate the nobility of the heart, thereby leading to cultivation of the nobility of action. So when the heart and the hands and hands are brought together on the principle of nobility, you can imagine the quality of our societies, the quality of our world, and indeed the quality of this dear, dear earth. I still believe that education can do that. Education ought to do that. Today, all around the world, there is so much of talk about education. But not everything that goes on in the name of education is education. We have to redeem education. This is the most important sector for the redemption of our societies, for the redemption of the world. We have built institutions, schools, colleges, and universities, temples of learning like never before. And we have engaged the most precious segment of the population, our children, our youth, young men and women. And we have marshaled the largest number of highly qualified people, our professors, our educators. We have invested huge amounts of money in building institutions, in um, injecting state-of-the-art technology. When we have so much of investment, in terms of human beings, as well as technical resources. Education ought to have a bigger purpose. It ought to be more meaningful. It ought to be more purposeful. It ought to be elevated. We have to use education to redeem those fractured relationships. Today, during COVID times, our teachers our children, our parents are so restless. They want to return to school as if there's no learning possible anywhere else but in schools. And maybe for right reasons. As an educator, as a teacher, I'm a great fan of schools, colleges, universities. I'm a great fan of children and a great fan of teachers and indeed a great fan of parents. Which means uh, we invest a lot of meaning in schools. We invest a lot of purpose in schools, but when we get together in schools, colleges, and universities, what actually happens? Do we see learning the way it ought to be happening? Is it meaningful? Is it purposeful? Today, unfortunately, the rains have started beating us. Our institutions seem to be falling from grace. I do not want to throw the baby with the bath water. I have, I have benefited from my teachers. I benefit from the great tradition bearers, the elders of the past, who have bequeathed to us great learning opportunities and handed down to us traditions, great foundations of learning. I'm so very grateful to them for what I have gained. And I still believe that uh, education is important, but it ought to serve a bigger purpose. We have to restore those lost meanings. We have to reclaim those lost grounds. Today's education, as I see it, is primarily mind-based, intellect-focused, and it draws its inspiration from the open market from the open market, 
from factories, from corporations, from employment agencies, which is right. And they have legitimate reasons to believe so. See. But I believe that um, education ought to be able to respond to the diverse claims that make our children who they are. Education ought to be able to respond to the diverse claimants that, that um, make the totality called the society, that constitute the, the totality called the nation, that make the totality called life. Life is more than the mind. Life is more than the intellect, as important as they are. The intellect is the factory of ideas. The mind is um, the laboratory of um, ideas. But ideas alone could be very sterile. They could be reductive. Dr. Foster's had all the great ideas. Dr. Foster's. He had the science. He had the technology. He had the great um, scientific mind, the intellect. But there were some, but Dr. Foster's also had that um, ability to distinguish between uh, what, what was coherent, what was able to connect, and what fragmented. Today we have Faustian science, we have Faustian technology, we have Faustian knowledge, but no Faustian music, no Faustian music. Only connect, only connect. E.M. Foster had said, today those connections are broken. So that is why in my little effort, my green school, my green school is now in, available in Hindi, Mera uh, Vidyanandala is my green school, as Dr. Vaishakha was saying, available in about 18 different languages now around the world. So my green school is an attempt to try to restore education to its original purpose, as limited as it may be. See? So my green school goes beyond the intellect, beyond the mind. It celebrates life as it is. It celebrates our connections, connections with our mother nature, our mother earth. That's why the first principle of my green school, the first circle, the first claimant of my green school is mother nature. Today, our mother nature is um, in a very sad state of affairs. But if we make our institutions, our seats of learning, sensitive to the need to respect our relationship between us, the human beings, and our planet Earth, I think um, the great disasters that have fallen, that have befallen us, and that can befall us at this rate of um, development can be avoided. The earth, the earth on which we walk, so unclean, so accepting, so uncomplaining, so generous. Have we been fair to the earth? Do our children, do our scholars, do our graduates know that um, we depend so much upon the earth? Every single day, see, we keep our feet on the on Mother Earth, on the soil that we walk. We never ask permission of Mother Earth. Can we walk on you? Can we walk on your surface? We never asked the gift of life-giving air, can we breathe you? See? We never asked our life-supporting water, can we drink you? See? We have taken so many things for granted. The sights and the sounds and the smells, the sea, the land and the sky, the last horizon, our mountains, our rivers, our streams, the gurgling waters, that come down from the mountains, the snow, 
the sky, the horizon. These are so very important. Uh, excuse me. As we live our lives, we claim that we are independent. We behave as if we are independent of nature. But without nature, we cannot live our lives. We need Mother Earth. We need the air that she supplies, the water that she provides, the oxygen that comes from the plants. We are only a little microcosm of the large macrocosm of this planet Earth. We behave as if we are the sole masters and consumers of the resources, the finite resources of our planet Earth. I feel that um, if our educational institutions, our curriculum builders, our policy makers truly, truly believe in the blessings of Mother Nature, in the gifts of Mother Nature, and respect the integrity of Mother Nature. Our life is going to be that much more sustainable. Our future is going to be that much more sustainable. So I feel that it's only right that um, our children, who are going to be the custodians of our future, our managers, our policy makers, our leaders, our managers, administrators, if they have developed a keen sensitivity towards the integrity of this relationship between us, the human beings, and Mother Nature, that will be so very important. In our current education system, <clears throat> we look at the Mother Nature only as an object of study, see? only as a subject of study. But Mother Nature, <clears throat> Before Mother Nature became a subject of our study, she was the object of our prayer. She was the object of our worship. That's what our ancestors did and saved our planet for us. For us. <clears throat> we do not do that today. That relationship has been broken. We have to restore that relationship that reverential, respectful, honorable relationship between us, the human beings, the human of the species, and Mother Nature. There is why in my green school, the first principle of our engagement as educators and as students, the receivers of education, and the givers of education ought to be the primacy of Mother Nature, the primacy of life. So as Dr. Vishaka mentioned earlier on, green is a metaphor. It's a color, but it is a metaphor. More importantly, it is a metaphor for life and anything and everything that supports life. That's why we can have a green school, a green university, a green economy, a green society. Green legislature, green parliaments, green business, green architecture, green orientation of the minds, green attitude, a green worldview. That will be much more healing. That will be much more harmonizing. And in the long run, much more sustainable. We will be able to leave something behind for our children and their children and their children and beyond. So my appeal to my fellow educators around the world is to recognize and honor this relationship between us, the human beings, and Mother Nature. This is an extremely important call at the restoration of life, at the restoration of those broken relationships. We can go on about um, this relationship between us and Mother Nature, but uh, the next very important claimant on education systems 
and on educators, policymakers, or on our institutions is that of the society. Today, society becomes just a subject of studies. But the society is a great, large, gigantic organizing principle. Here are people, here are human beings, men, women, and children who animate the society, who give life to the society. There are people with feelings. But we do not talk about, um, about the society as a, an organizing principle. When our children come to school, colleges and universities, they come not only <clears throat> as individual entities with their bodies and with their books and stationaries. They come to our school with um, their culture, with their values, with their with them, with their with their social mores, with their in their totality as emotional, psychological, intellectual, social beings. When they come to school, they meet people who they have never met before. They become friends with the individuals, boys and girls, they had never met before. They forge relationships. They build um, understanding and harmony. They build bridges. So I feel that in education system, our institutions must be places where these lifelong relationships, understanding, trust, the ability to create harmony, the ability to create positive energy and goodwill ought to be fostered. When our children graduate from our schools, colleges, and universities and join the larger societies, they must be bridge, bridge builders. They must be bridge builders, problem solvers, team makers. They must be able to harmonize, really, harmonize societies, communities, neighborhoods, families, nations. So social greenery is... Um, in my scheme of things, an understanding of, an appreciation of the need to forge, to create that base for forging of relationships, social relationships as human, as social beings that human beings are. That is why the second element in my green school is social greenery. The third element is culture. Today, we don't talk about culture, but without culture, we are nobody. See? The great cultures of the world, the great foundations are points of reference, great points of reference, our philosophies, our religions, our discoveries, <clears throat> our inventions, the march of human beings, where we came from, where we are going, how did we get the way we... <coughs> How did we get to be the way that we are, see? How did we learn to articulate the way we do? Sorry about it. <clears throat> How do we dress the way we do? How do we speak the way we do? How do we organize our celebrations the way we do? Celebrate our marriages, birthdays, conduct our rituals, our songs, our dances, our games, our sports, the way we cook our food, the way we prepare our drinks. The way we organize the marriages, conduct our death rituals, the way we build our homes, our architecture, our art, our literature, our songs, our dances. These are so important. They give us a, they, they give us a sense of self-respect, a sense of identity, a sense of who we are. See, culture is so important. All nations, all communities have great cultures. But today, the succeeding smartness of the smartness of succeeding generations is more focused on the immediate present. Without culture, we lose our roots. 
we lose our anchors, our emotional, psychological anchors, points of reference. The great civilizations of the past, our foundations, they're so very important. Culture defines who we are, as I can see on the screen. Yes, indeed. So very kind of you. Um, so, also, <clears throat> so culture is so important. Culture is an extremely important uh, part of my green school. Today, the world is becoming flat. Thanks to Thomas Friedman, the world is flat. There's a flattening of cultures, standardization of cultures. And to the extent that it happens, we also lose those nuances, cultural nuances, the points, the counterpoints, the highs, the lows the beauty, the music that uh, creates that um, those um, nuances to, in communities, in families, in societies, in nations. Culture is so important. As, um, as tech savvy and um, future oriented as we want to be, it is important not to lose our roots our points of references, where we came from and who we are, how we proclaim to the world who we are, our identity, our sense of belonging. Succeeding generations ought to know this. Our children ought to know their roots. The next element is um, academics. Um, I finished my time, I guess. Um, uh, academics is so very important. Um, in academics, um, <clears throat> Today, what happens is that uh, the moment we come to our schools, colleges, and universities, we start with the syllabus, curriculum. Open the book on chapter nine, Sim. Yes, and start. But um, that's important. However, we have to understand the nature of those very important disciplines. We have, the, we have our sciences, we have our mathematics, the humanities, the social studies, technology, music, sports, everything. Sim. But we have to be able to make meaning with these disciplines. We have been teaching physics for a thousand years. What is the nature of physics, for example? What makes physics physics and not history? What is mathematics? What is so mathematical about mathematics? What is so historical about history? Or historic about history? How is literature different from language or geography? What is the nature of these disciplines? That is why we have to look into the nature of these disciplines and make meaning. When I spend nine when I spend five hours in a school per day and uh, study six subjects or five subjects, am I making meaning as a result of that study? See? What sense do I make of my studies? We have to be able to look into the eye, into the heart of these academic disciplines. Whether it is um, IT, music, sports, uh, <clears throat> mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology, history, geography, literature, language, whatever these are, to truly make meaning out of these. Today, I see a lot of restlessness in parents and children because they feel that they have lost something very important. If they are able to go to school, they'll be able to study all these subjects and succeed in life. That's important. But what is even more important is uh, how do we make meaning out of these? I see a lot of wonderful things happening at home, in children's homes during the pandemic. They're being very creative, which is so important. That's very important part of education. So when our children spend 15 years, 20 years in our schools, colleges, universities, and um, spend large, a large chunk of their time, <clears throat> life, in our seats of learning. Education ought to be purposeful. It ought to be meaningful. It ought to be worthwhile and fulfilling. So academic greenery has got to go right into the nature of these academic disciplines. The next one is aesthetics. Aesthetics is important because um, aesthetics um, is able to expand the range of our life. A life as it is could be limited. 
by our um, occupations, by our social constraints, by our values, and by our need to fulfill the expectations of the society. But aesthetics, our hobbies, our likes, our, our preferences, these, um, these, our, our fondness for music, our, our taste for music, our choice for music, our choice for dress, food, games, songs that we have, the places that we, we want to visit, the things that we want to see, wear, see, the kind of design that we want to have for our, for our, <clears throat> for our clothes, the kind of food we want to eat, the drinks that we enjoy, see. Our individuality, our uniqueness is expressed through our aesthetic sensibilities. Aesthetic, aesthetics, our choices, our preferences expand the range of our life. They give us, they, they proclaim who we are. In our offices, in our occupations, we are more or less standard. We follow similar rules. We behave similarly. But our, our hobbies, our preferences, our likes and dislikes give us that individuality, that space, that unique universe, which is very much our own. Today, our children are all the time focused on the gadgets, and the mobile phones, which are great. And technology is great. But a time could come when especially young children could, um, could be totally seduced by technology. Technology can suck the soul out of children. See? There's our aesthetics, time for music, time for fine art, time for painting, Time to go out for a little walk. Time to appreciate beauty. What is grateful, what is graceful, what is truly authentically beautiful, genuinely beautiful, what actually refines our tastes. This is so very important. So we need to be able to provide through our school system, education system, through learning. We have to restore the uniqueness of children, their individuality. So restorative learning actually is, uh, in fact, going back to those foundations that give life its purpose, its, its meaning. Spirituality is another claim. Spirituality. Spirituality has got nothing to do with religion or religiosity. Spirituality is the need in us, in humans. Men and women, boys and girls, children, all of us. As we are, we are not perfect. As we are, we are not complete. As we are, we are not full. But all the time, we are looking for ways and means to be fuller, to be more perfect, to be more complete, to be more, to be more fulfilled. We are looking for opportunities. We are looking for models. Looking, we are looking for those symbols. Those, those um, icons, they could be great personalities. They could be our parents, our teachers. It could be an object of nature, see? but something that elevates us, something that, that, re that in fact makes us feel fuller, better actualized, more realized. That I call spiritual greeneries. Spiritual greenery. It's got nothing to do with religion. So finally, I have what is called <clears throat> what is called is that ethical greenery or moral greenery. Morality or ethics deals with our ability to distinguish between categories of values. And what are these values that make us who we are as the human of the species? Our ability to distinguish between right and wrong, good from bad, and truth from falsehood. These are those great uh, abilities um, that make us human beings, homo sapiens, rational beings, thinking beings. Today, all around the world, there is so much of, so much of 
there's so much of um, talk about corruption. Great people, company CEOs falling from grace overnight. Companies collapsing because at that level, very often, people lose sight of what is right and wrong. Power, power seduces them and greed reduces them. See? Leaders fall from grace. Companies collapse because of this inability to distinguish between right and wrong, good and bad, true and false, truth and falsehood. That's why in our school system, education system, in our temples of learning, there must be an engagement of young people in deep, deep reflection about the state of the world, the fate of humanity, the destiny of nations. And all these are based on those principles. We are, we are, we are, we are alienating ourselves. We are, we are separating ourselves from those foundations. That's why restorative learning operates at many levels. It operates at the level of us vis-a-vis -vis Mother Nature, us and the society and culture and the mind and, and sources of knowledge, academics, aesthetics, spirituality and ethics. If we are able to restore these <clears throat> fundamental relationships, our learning, our teaching and learning, our educational enterprise will be that much more meaningful, that much more fulfilling. And to that end, our children who graduate from our schools, colleges and universities and join the larger society later will be able to release these values to the society, to the nation and create the world that we wish to create and leave behind for future generations. Herculean task, as I can see on the screen, but education is important. As the old pilgrims progress, as the old pilgrim said in John Bunyan's, the pilgrims progress. <clears throat> Better though difficult, the right way to go, then wrong, which though easy, where the end is woe, W-O-E. So that's why we cannot uh, nourish our children's lives uh, on ice cream. We have to be able to provide something more worthwhile, more meaningful. There's a My Green School is an attempt, a humble attempt at that at um, restoring learning to a more authentic, more purposeful and more fulfilling mode as an instrument for human and societal flourishing. I'll stop here. Thank you very much again. I don't know if there is time for questions, but uh, I'll be happy to respond to some of them. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, sir. That was wonderful, very insightful, very inspiring. Thank you so much. And I'm sure all the viewers have benefited. I'm sure about it. Is there somebody still around? Yes. Uh, can you hear me, sir? I can, yes. <clears throat> okay. Uh, is there any, uh, any questions? I think all the viewers are uh, very impressed and they are benefited by your lecture, sir. They must have gone home. Uh, no, no, they are still there. And this was actually a much needed educative thought. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, friends, you, sir. to be in harmony with Professor Podel's lecture on my green school, which essentially emphasizes the beautiful idea of supporting and sustaining life and living. I will sing on behalf of Asian Literary Society, a few lines from Michael Jackson.
okay? Uh, here, are, here, here I go. There's a place in your heart and I know that it is love and this place is much brighter than tomorrow and if you really try you'll find there's no need to cry in this place you'll feel there's no hurt or sorrow there are ways to get there if you care enough for the living make a little space make a better place heal the world make it a better place for you and for me and the entire human race there are people dying if you care enough for the living make a better place for you and for me thank you friends that's a green song yeah. a beautiful. thank you sir we should have, um, we should have um, more of that than we talk <laughs> um, before concluding the program on behalf of asian literary society uh, wish you all a joyous healthy and prosperous year ahead and sir we are greatly benefited asian literary society is immensely grateful to you sir thank you so much <laughs> Thank you so much indeed. Before you wind up, I would like to wish all of you, wherever you are in the world, a very happy new year ahead. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. No questions. There are questions, yes, believe us. There, there is one. Uh, there is a question. I think there is a question, sir. Mm, uh, can this green learning program uh, be imparted to other schools? absolutely yes in fact uh, the fact that um, this little book is uh, getting translated into several languages around the world is uh, actually indi indicative of the fact that there's a desire to um, look at education look at education differently and that um, that um, you know it can be it can be implemented elsewhere as well so i'm very happy that uh, Uh, many countries are actually implementing some of the ideas in um, in their own countries um, uh, idea that i shared just now with you and it, this curriculum is not limited to bhutan alone uh, so uh, dr tandon so nisha tandon it is not limited to bhutan alone it's um, it's being taught in uh, several countries actually and this also forms um, uh, important material for researchers and uh, policy makers planners so what uh, so indeed uh, character building was an important uh, element uh, of education in the past uh, humanization character building today we have actually disconnected ourselves from that role we have to rehabilitate that role that's why restorative learning is so important uh, um yes indeed i think the covid times have um, dr vandana Uh, covid times have actually given us opportunities to think of education differently that there are alternative ways of learning and educating ourselves and our children so it is not that uh, we learn only in schools and in the formal places so much of teaching and learning also happened uh, during the covid times in our own homes uh, in our communities um, even though of course um, nothing like going back to school and college and university but uh, i think we did a very good job even during the covid times uh, how do we impart these values to younger generation we have been doing this um, in the country from the time we started um, this program in 2009 what we did was um, sorry um yes um, what we did was um, <laughs> back to the same school uh, question what we did was train all our school leaders all our school leaders and in bhutan we are counting about 600 school leaders um, and deputy leaders and teachers we train all of them and um, and uh, brought them on board um, we 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 infused our our schools um, institutions with the with the ideas of um, green school and uh, prepared materials so we actually implemented and it continues to be implemented even to this day and uh, plan to extend the thoughts in schools in india yes 
Uh, in fact, a, a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> His Excellency, the Honorable Education Minister of India, uh, was very kind to endorse um, the the book um, Hindi translation of um, My Green School and uh, said that um, uh, he will not only read it himself, but also make it available across the country. And the Honorable Former Education Minister of India, His Excellency Dr. Ramesh Pokhriyal, was very kind to grant a foreword for the Hindi edition in which he, he talks about um, the relevance of this book, um, the, the message of the book um, to the new education policy 2020. And also, in fact, uh, says that um, the content of the book recalls the ancient educational thought um, that had to do with um, civilization, humanization through education. So I think a lot is happening in India. And there are institutions in India which have started um, uh, green schools uh, programs um, and uh, quite a few translations. Uh, the book is also available in Canada. Canada is being translated into Urdu and perhaps also in Maratha. And uh, Hindi is already available. So, so it's uh, very much um, um, available in India and they're already being implemented in some quarters. Thank you. Thank you. Then uh, I think we have, we have answered a few questions or taken a few questions. And the more you can um, write down in the, in the chats, and uh, then later on we can discuss with Professor Podel. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, friends. Thank you, viewers. Uh, thank you for the questions and uh, wonderful questions at that. And uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity to share some of my thoughts with all of you. So, once again, do take care and stay safe. Happy New Year ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Happy New Year.